All right, so hello. Hi, so let's get started. Uh, good afternoon and thank you all for being here today. My name is Andrew Hawks and I'm the coordinator of public programs and public engagement here at the Whitney. It's, um, I'm delighted to introduce tonight's program, From Seneca Village to Brooklyn, a conversation with Tamashi Jackson. For the past four months, it has been such a great pleasure to help surface the many diverse voices and practices seen in the 2019 biennial through our public programs and performances. I, of course, have to extend a warm thank you to Jane Panetta and Rujeko Hockley for making all of this possible. And as the exhibition moves into its final week, I couldn't think of a artist who I'd happier to work with than Tamashi. <laughs> um, Tamashi Jackson's vibrant and energetic works upstairs knit together complex histories, personal narratives through the use of found materials such as paper shopping bags, food wrappers, final installation strips, and storefront awnings. Jackson creates these densely layered abstractions to visualize and create dialogues about different histories of dispossession and displacement, especially of black and brown communities. Today's program was brought about through numerous conversations with Tamashi over the months, and we've brought together many artists, historians, scholars, and archeologists who were important to Tamashi in the shaping of this work. It's our hope that this program will not only reveal Seneca Village's richness, but also surface the parallels and echoes that we are seeing today, um, including the city's current third party transfer program designed to siege paid for properties in rapidly gentrifying communities across New York. I would also like to acknowledge an even longer history of displacement and remind us that we are, sorry, I would, <laughs> I would also like to acknowledge an even longer history of displacement and remind us that we are on indigenous land, specifically that of the Lena Lenape. I hope that this acknowledgement can help us think about other histories that we need to know in order to understand the present. Uh, I would like to now uh, introduce the speakers in the order of their presentations. And there are quite a few, so I'll be brief. Uh, Marie Warsh is a, a landscape historian and writer. She has worked for the Central Park Historian, uh, Central Park Conservatory for 13 years and is currently the historian. Recent research projects include Central Park Playgrounds, resulting in a book about the playgrounds from 1960s and 70s that is forthcoming in the fall of 2019. Her current research is focused on monuments in Central Park and the history of Seneca Village. Working with the Institute for Exploration of Seneca Village, she has developed a program of interpretive signage that will be installed in the park in October of 2019, so very soon. Uh, and she is also the co-editor of Prospect, a journal of art and writing on various landscape topics. Nan Rothschild is, an art histor is, art, is a historical archeologist and professor at Columbia University, whose focus has always entailed the intersection of social and material. She has done field work in New York City and New Mexico. She is the author of New York City Neighborhoods, the 18th Century Colonial Encounters in a Native American Landscape, The Archeology span of American Cities with Diana Wall and many articles. Diana Desirga Wall is a professor emeritus at the City College and CUNY Graduate Center. She specializes in the archeology span of New York City and has looked, for the construction, looked at the construction of gender, race, and class in the city from the 17th through the 19th century. Her books include Unearth and Gotham uh, with Anne Marie Cantwell and The Archeology span of America Cities with Nan Rothschild. Meredith B. Lynn is an assistant professor of historical archeology span at Bard Graduate Center. Her work uh, is focused on the 19th century New York City, particularly on the health-related experiences and strategies of Irish communities um, and upon Seneca Village, the predominantly African-American community whose land was taken by the city to construct Central Park. Lynn was also part of the team that excavated Seneca Village and is a co-author with Nan Rothschild and Diane Desirga Wall of the archeological report of the site. Uh, she has also published articles about Irish immigrant research and is currently working on books about both projects. K. Sue Park is an associate professor of law at Georgetown University Law Center, where she teaches about property, immigration, and the creative creation of the United States land system through the process of colonialization. Park is a recipient of the fellowships from UCLA of law and the Fulbright program. Her writings have appeared in major publications such as Contemporary Art Quarterly and the New York Times. Kelly Minna is a housing reporter for the Brooklyn Eagle covering foreclosures, deed theft, and tenant rights. She was formerly senior editor at the Kings County Politics. Her work has appeared in Our Time Press. Subasa Berg is a photographer based in Brooklyn, New York, and he has um, worked for Kings County Politics. 
Stephen Witt is, our, is a writer and journalist based in New York. He currently writes for our press and, and BanksLoveMe.com and previously was a staff reporter at The Courier, Life, and News Corp. Uh, Witt's writings have appeared in City and State, The Village Voice, and City Limits, among other media outlets. In 2005, he received a New York Press Association's News Story of the Year for a piece written about group homes in Graveshead. And finally, Tourmaline is an artist and filmmaker whose works include Salacia, Mary of Three Fame, Atlantic is a Sea of Bones, The Personal Things, Lost in Music, and Happy Birthday, Marsha. She is also the editor of Trapdoor, an anthology on trans cultural production published by New, New Museum and MIT Press. Um, and finally, Tamashi Jackson will close out by giving remarks in response to these mini presentations. Uh, it's now my honor to turn things over to Marie Warsh. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Tamashi, for putting this together and the Whitney for organizing it. So I'm going to talk about how Seneca Village and really the entire site slated for Central Park was portrayed as a blighted place, a wasteland. And this is uh, one of the ways that Tamashi has really connected Seneca Village and the third party transfer program scandal, which you'll hear more about later. Um, and what I've tried to do is dig a little deeper into some of these portrayals and to also look at a broad variety of sources in which they appear as a way to try to discern what they tell us about attitudes towards Seneca Village and the park and also race and class in, in mid 19th century New York. And in what I'm doing, I'm, I'm not trying to downplay the sort of racism inherent in a lot of these characterizations, but sort of look at how they're embedded in, in other narratives. And this is a topic that could really be a, a book. So this brief presentation is really just an introduction to some of the ideas I've been thinking about as part of this um, presentation. And, and really the main idea I'm exploring is that this depiction of Seneca Village as a wasteland really had multiple purposes. When you read all of the sources, it's clear that it wasn't the only depiction, even though it was the most prevailing one. But these sources do give us some sense of what this place was really like. And this map here shows the entire site that was slated for Central Park, which was about 750 acres. Um, there were a total of approximately 1,600 people who lived on the land. Um, and so it was, it was very big. So, while some areas were maybe not as nice as others, the entire site was definitely not a wasteland. Uh, this is the site of Seneca Village, and I'm just gonna do um, a brief overview of Seneca Village and what we know about it. Um, Seneca Village was approximately five acres. It existed between 1825 and 1857, and it was located between approximately 82nd Street and 89th Street and 7th and 8th Avenues. And it began in 1825 when African Americans affiliated with an important church downtown, the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, began purchasing land in the area. And over time, they began settling up here. And by 1855, there were approximately 50 homes and 250, uh, 230 people living up there. And most of what we know about Seneca Village is really in 1855, and this is because there um, were maps documenting all of the people who lived there and also a census. So we don't know so much about what was going on in Seneca Village, let's say in the 1830s and 40s, but we do have a good picture of it in 1855. The majority of the population was approx um, approximately two thirds was, were African American, um, and the rest of the population, approximately one third, were Irish immigrants. So we don't have any photographs of Seneca Village. Uh, the map we were just looking at is one of the few images of this place. It was created as part of a survey of the land, as part of planning for the construction of the park. But as a result of there being so few images of the Seneca Village, certain images that don't necessarily depict it have become symbols of it, or symbols or evidence of how it was being portrayed, such as this image, which is captioned Squatter Settlement, now Central Park, so it doesn't necessarily depict Seneca Village, but it's often used in, um, in blog posts and articles, and Tamashi integrated this into one of her works as well, a sort of symbol of how Seneca Village was portrayed. 
And it seems like by presenting those living on the land as squatters, it made them have no claims on the land itself and they could be more easily removed. They were already breaking the law, it implied. Um, and you know, this was part of, you know, part of the motivations for this depiction, and this is one of them, was to really justify taking so much land for this purpose, which was something people, was very unprecedented and that some people felt somewhat uneasy about it. What this image also depicts is the rockiness of the site. This was something that was accurate. And one of the ways it was considered blighted was because it was covered in rock outcrop, or a large portion of it was, which really made it difficult to develop for real estate. So I was wondering about the source of this image. This is some, an image you can find kind of easily online, and it's in the New York Public Library's image database. Um, and it comes from um, a guidebook to New York City from 1873. And when I found it, I kind of got excited, and I thought, oh, maybe it'll talk about Seneca Village. Um, but it was interesting, because it didn't mention anything specific about it at all, about the people who lived there. But this is actually typical. There's really mostly very general descriptions of the park site, and they're all very similar. Um, and the description here talks about how the site of the park, again, was this most broken of the island and considered irredeemable, but then the creation of the park transformed it. Um, and this is a lot of the type of language that you hear in describing the pre-park site and then what happened. Um, a, lot, a lot of times they use these biblical references and they really are kind of presenting it as a wasteland that was transformed into a paradise. So this is another, um, one of the purposes for these types of depictions is really to kind of present the park as this really dramatic transformation. And um, so it's a way in, to really promote the park. So I'm choosing another quote to make the point that typically when sources are specific about the squatters, they're typically um, referring to them as Irish. So, and this description really could be an illustration of the image that I showed earlier, talking about a dreary waste of sterile rocks, filthy sinkholes and pools of stagnant water, and then the rickety one-story shanties and a mixed population of squatters, mostly Irish. So these depictions seem to be part of a larger tradition of sensationalized reporting about the poor that appeared in city guides and newspapers in the mid to late 19th century. And it really presented kind of contrasting images of the city in terms of darkness and light. And this is one of the most well-known of these city guides um, from 1868. And this is the frontispiece, which portrays on the top uh, a Fifth Avenue mansion, and then on the bottom, the notorious brewery that was in the Five Points um, neighborhood of downtown. And this has a section on Central Park, and of course I got excited about what would it say, maybe it says something about Seneca Village, but of course it describes the pre-park site as the most abandoned and filthy spots in the city, um, and presented the park as, as a paradise. Um, and those who have written about these guidebooks and descriptions have talked about how they were really targeted to a middle class audience, and presented the city's population in this real simplified binary of rich and poor and dark and light as a way to deal with the complexity of rising immigration and increasing social, social stratification. So really a way to kind of simplify the social um, upheaval that was taking place in New York City in the 19th century. And it also becomes a way to map the city to sort of, a, sort of this moral geography, like good people live here and bad people live here, and to create these kind of tantalizing and um, sensationalized images of different places that were hard to reach or people thought were too dangerous to go. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about what was actually there. So this is, um, the designers of the park also use this sense of contrast to present their idea of what the park would be. This is from a presentation um, that they did submitting their design um, for Central Park. And the top shows a photograph of what the site looked like. It's one of the few photographs that we have of the site. And then the bottom is a painting of what they envisioned the design would be. If you get a closer up view, you can see some of the details of the landscape, that it is quite rocky and that 
it is somewhat barren, but it is also early April is when this photograph or late March was taken. So there wouldn't have been a lot of um, vegetation in view. And if you see even closer up, there's a house in the landscape. And this is not Seneca Village, but this is a house that was not far away. And it gives us a sense of what some of the houses in Seneca Village may have looked like. It's not a shanty, it's, excuse me, it's a two-story house. It has a chimney and a paned window and also a shed that's um, attached. There also seems to be an orchard in the distance on the top right and a road, possibly one of the streets that were being laid out according to the city's grid plan. And again, while it doesn't depict Seneca Village, it sort of, it can give us a sense of what they may have looked like. Um, we know um, more about the houses of Seneca Village because of this map. And this was the map created as part of the process for planning Central Park. And it documented all of the different houses and described them and also who lived there and who owned them. So the city did not identify the people living on this land as squatters. They were trying to figure out actually who owned the land and who to pay for it. Um, and so this is one of the most important documents that we have of Seneca Village. Um, we were talking earlier about how we use this image or details of this map over and over again because it's really one of the few um, documents of Seneca Village that conveys what this place might have looked like. So in looking at some other articles and other guidebooks, there are some that present a much more diversified landscape. And these tend to be journalists who um, were taking carriage rides through the park site before the park was built, and they describe what they see. So instead of these general depictions of the entire site as a wasteland of squatters, you actually have more specific descriptions of different areas of the park. A lot of them talk about how the northern part of the park site, so in the 90s and the 100s was really beautiful and that there are all these rolling hills um, and beautiful views. And it was much less built up in that area. It was quite rural. Um, so you have a lot of descriptions of how nice that was. Um, some of them talk about how there's a lot of different types of houses. Uh, this article talks about there's the slab shanty of the Celtic squatter, but then there's also the two-story dwelling of some richer and better citizen. This article also talks about how a lot of these houses have gardens and orchards, signifying that it was a productive landscape, that it wasn't a wasteland. The next article I'm gonna show is actually one of the only of about 10 newspaper articles describing this place that actually mentions Seneca Village specifically, and it names it using a racial slur commonly used at the time. What's interesting about this as part of what I've been looking at is that it aims to create a sense of stratification within the population of those living in the park. The African Americans present a pleasing contrast in their habits and appearance of their dwellings to the Celtic occupants. So it's kind of pushing them to, um, pointing them against each other. It also creates a little bit more of a geographical distinction mentioning that the shanties were located in the lower part of the park, meaning the southern part of the park. And this was also making me think about some of the characterizations of the whole site as a wasteland and a shanty town. And really, this is a map of the um, southern part of the site, which was noted in a few places as being a sort of place where there were a lot of um, Irish living in, sh in shanties. There were also a lot of... Um, industries such as bone boiling and tanneries. So it wasn't that nice of a place. There was also a lot of swamps here. So one thought I had is that this was really the most accessible part of, of this area because it was the furthest south and that people were coming to check out this place and seeing this area and then making assumptions about the entire area. When you look at this map, um, this bird's eye view of Manhattan at the time, you can really see um, the Seneca Village site and the pre-park site is located up here. Um, and really that was quite far away from the centers of population um, as they were growing. So 
So I'm going to just conclude. Um, sorry, I lost my paper. Um, talking a little bit about how, even though, sorry, let me see if I can find this paper. So one of the challenges of researching Seneca Village is that while we're really lucky to have a lot of important information in census and other government documents, there are really so few descriptions and images of the village which make imagining what it did look like and what life was like for the people who live there a challenge. And as I've tried to do here, I think it's also important to look closely at some of these documents and try to understand what they were trying to communicate and for whom they were intended. And to set up the next presenters, I also want to add that there is a lot to learn in and from the current landscape of the park, even though it doesn't really look like that when you go out there. The designers of the park did completely transform the landscape, but they also preserved in the process aspects of it, such as rocks and hills, and these really provide us with a tangible connection to Seneca Village. This is a rock outcrop that was right in the heart of the village and is still there today. And as archaeological discoveries show, it was this type of rock that was used to create the buildings in the village. And so while the creation of the park did result in the destruction of this place, we should look at it now as another source of information about it. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. I want to thank both the museum and Tamashi for organizing the program. I think they did a terrific job. Um, my name is Diana Wall, in case you've forgotten, <laughs> and I'm an archaeologist. And we're, 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 I and the next two presenters are talking about are the uh, is the uh, the archaeological project that took place there about uh, eight or nine years ago. Um, and basically, what I'm going to begin with is talking about how we found, quote unquote, the village and uh, the village as an archaeological site, what we did to locate the buildings that had been there and what we did to plan the excavation. Then what's going to happen is Meredith will pick up the baton and discuss what we found in terms of artifacts, giving examples of some of the things we can learn about ways of life in the village from them. And then finally, Nan will talk about how villagers ha may have constructed place in Seneca Village. I first heard about Seneca Village, and I should say that I grew up in New York City, and I never heard of Seneca Village until the early 1990s with the publication of the book that, uh, again, which was the original historical source that brought Seneca Village back to us again. Uh, and that book is The Park and the People. This is the story of Central Park. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, sorry. Good point. Okay. The, the Park and the People. Betsy Blackmore. What's the matter? Ah, thanks a lot. I got it now. I see. Uh, and th that was the first time that I heard of it. Uh, she and Roy Rosenzweig wrote this book. I think Roy Rosenzweig did the study of Seneca Village that appeared and almost took up a whole chapter talking about what was there before. And that, in a sense, became our Bible, those of us who were interested in Seneca Village. And it still is, I have to say. Um, I had just started uh, teaching at City College when I heard about it. And it became a wonderful, to me, it became a wonderful what if story. What if the inhabitants of, of the village had left an archaeological site behind them? What if the village, uh, the site had survived the creation of Central Park and its constructed landscape? It would be a wonderful project to work on with students, was what I thought. At that point, this is the early 1990s, I approached the Central Park Conservancy, but at that point they weren't interested. Meanwhile, Cynthia Copeland, who unfortunately is not here today, had started working on before Central Park, The Life and Death of Seneca Village, the critically acclaimed exhibit on Seneca Village at the New York Historical Society again in the late 90s. 
I joined forces with her and with Nan Rothschild from Columbia, and we formed what we called then the Seneca Village Project, which is now the Institute for the Exploration of Seneca Village History, a very long and pompous name, which we apologize for sometimes. <laughs> Our first goal was to see if, in fact, an archaeological site had survived there, and then, if it had, to excavate and get a sample of the data to find out about how the people of Seneca Village lived. Along the way, we got several grants from the National Science Foundation to work with undergraduates to answer those questions. So first of all, what we had to do was to find the site and to, to prove to the Central Park Conservancy and to the Department of Parks not to mention ourselves, that there was a site there and that we were serious. You will see this map a lot, as you know. <laughs> you already have. Uh, and this is the same condemnation map which uh, Marie showed. We began our study with research from documents. We looked at maps like this one, the condemnation map, census records. The 1855 census is on the left. And uh, t we have tax records, we have death records for the people who were buried in Seneca Village. There were uh, three churches in Seneca Village and each of them had a graveyard. And then after we did that, did the study of the documents, we did a study of, uh, <coughs> sorry, the soils there. We began by using an old soil map of Central Park, which had been made in the 80s, to identify general areas where it looked like ground had, the ground had not been disturbed. In other words, this was looking at the Seneca Village site on a macro level. And then the other thing we did was we brought in a, a geoarchaeologist. In other words, that's an archaeologist who deals with soils and also with uh, and also with archaeology, and so that we could find out on a micro level where this, the ground had not been disturbed and where there were houses. In some areas, we found what appeared to be old ground surfaces and early 19th century artifacts that could be from Seneca Village in areas where uh, we knew that there had been houses from looking at the maps and things like that. Then the next thing, and sorry, on the right is a profile of the Corings. The green areas are areas where there, there were artifacts. This is you know, going down from the ground surface of the top, down under the ground. Artifacts are charcoal. And this was very helpful in figuring out where to dig. Then finally, in terms of our preparation, we also did ground penetrating radar. And the idea with the ground penetrating radar was to, found, was to find features in other words, what we call non-portable artifacts like stone walls, uh, so that we could use that again to guide our uh, to guide our digging. So, using all of this data from documents, soil studies, and the ground penetrating radar, we reached a verdict in 2005. It looked as though there was, in fact, a site there. We identified four areas where it seemed that archaeological traces of the village still survived in the ground. But now we had to, as archaeologists say, ground truth or inferences by excavation. In other words, actually look to see if our interpretations were right. And to do that, we needed to get permission from uh, the Parks Department and the Conservancy. That exercise took us six years. But we finally succeeded with the help of our advisory committee, who I have to say was extremely helpful to us throughout. And we finally got permission and began excavation in the summer of 2011. And there we are in the field on the left. And there is that map you know very well. And I'm going to pass the baton to Meredith, who's going to talk about some of the things we found. Thanks again so much to Andrew and Tomashi and everyone at the Whitney for inviting us. So as Diana mentioned, um, in 2011 we started our excavation and found two areas in particular um, that had, were very artifact rich. Um, and I'm going to focus mostly on the area of the Wilson House, the one on the top. Um, so we knew um, some things about the Wilson family. 
uh, from the research that we, we had done uh, from documents. We knew, for example, from the census that the Wilson family was composed of parents, William Godfrey Wilson and Charlotte Morris Wilson, and that they had eight children, ranging in age from 17 years to four months. And we knew from church records that Mr. Wilson was the sexton of the nearby All Angels Church, which you can see here. Um, it's the only building that is um, not oriented sort of on a uh, north-south grid. And it's a, good, it's a good building when you're looking at these maps to use as a place to pinpoint where you are in space. Um, and we also knew that, that the condemnation map suggested that the house was about 20 feet by 21 feet, um, three stories made of wood. Um, and we kind of speculated what it would be like to raise a family of 10 in such a small space, even with three floors. Um, uh, we, the, the map here says that the owner of the land that the house was on was unknown, but we did know from other records that um, the Wilsons owned this land. And we also knew that uh, Mr. Wilson was a voter. Um, so there were quite a few things we knew about the family, but we had lots of other questions, and we were really excited to, to um, find out if there was any traces of, of what the Wilson's life were like left in the ground. And fortu fortunately, our first test cut came down uh, on the foundation of the Wilson House, which you already saw a picture of before here. Um, I'd like to say that that was all about skill, um, but it was a little bit of luck too, and we took that as a good omen that our fir very first test cut came up with something that doesn't always happen in archaeology. Um, and as uh, Marie mentioned, this foundation was built of the local schist that comes up out of the ground that you can see today. And, and this material that was one of the things that people used to suggest this place was a wasteland. Well, the Wilson family uh, utilized it as a strong foundation to support those three stories of their home. Um, and it's possible that Mr. Wilson himself um, participated in building this house, that it wasn't um, something done by outsiders, but uh, a product of his own labor. Um, we also found remnants over here on the right of a brick chimney made of locally uh, made bricks that were plastered. And today we might think of um, exposed brick as quite fashionable and trendy, but in the 19th century it was less desirable because plastered brick would have been easier to clean and presented a, a neater and at the time more fashionable appearance. Um, we also found some metal sheets um, which you can sort of see, I don't know, you see this jagged edge right here, and this, I know it's a little bit hard to distinguish from the dirt, but these metal sheets throughout the site um, on the interior of uh, the foundation, uh, which we believe was a, the remains of a tin-coated iron roof, uh, which would have been a considerable, considerable investment and also provided superior protection from rain and fire uh, with, when compared with more common wooden roofing. So all in all, the architectural remains of the Wilson House suggested it was something that the family had made a significant investment in, in both money and also potentially their own labor and time. In addition to architectural remains, we found an, an assortment of all kinds of artifacts, um, some of which you can see here. So ceramics, glass bottles, uh, including wine bottles, a perfume bottle, a bone-handled toothbrush, slate writing pencils, buttons, hooks, eyes, and even a shoe, um, and, and many more things that I don't have uh, time to talk about today. But collectively, they can tell us quite a bit about what the Wilsons ate, how they took care of themselves, and how they presented themselves to others, um, maybe more on their own terms as compared to how they were portrayed in the press. Um, so I'm just going to focus briefly on one um, kind of set of artifacts that tell us a little bit about what the Wilsons put on their table. Archaeologists find evidence of diet primarily through two types of remains, actual food remains like bones and plant remains, and then also in the vessels that were used to cook and serve them. Um, the premise about the vessels is that forms of dishes relate to types of cuisine that are held in them. So bowls with sides would hold um, foods that are predominantly liquids, whereas flat plates would hold things like chops and steaks that are drier meals. At the Wilsons, we recovered a lot of, of, of bowls. We recovered plates too, but, but a, a lot of bowls. They really stood out that there were um, more bowls maybe than um, 
typical for a residential site. And we tested that assumption by comparing um, the, the ratio or the number of bowls to plates at the Wilson House with two other middle class families downtown in Greenwich Village, the Hertz and the Robsons. And we did find that the Wilsons seem to have um, a higher number of bowls than is typical. Um, and we looked at, took a closer look at the bones and we found that the majority of them were cuts from long bones from cows and sheep, the kinds of bones usually used to make soups and stews. So this combination of bowls and bones suggested to us that soups and stews were probably the meal that appeared most often on the table at the Wilson home. Now, why the Wilsons chose to serve that kind of meal is a more difficult question to answer. Um, it's quite, quite possible that the Wilsons were economizing to feed their large family and maybe even using locally raised food to be more self-sufficient. And you'll hear more about um, those foods from Nan in a moment. And soups and stews might have also been easier for the younger children in the family to digest. But we also know that people's food choices aren't solely based on practicality. People eat in ways that have been passed down to them as the appropriate thing to do, the appropriate kind of thing to construct a meal out of. And oftentimes, these food traditions are very important to people's identities. We know from other archaeological sites in the American South and along the East Coast, as well as from oral histories, that soups and stews have been important to many African American communities. And many recipes have roots in West African traditions that were subsequently transformed through the African diaspora. It's very possible that the bowls excavated from the Wilson House once held some of these recipes, and that these stews passed on African American food traditions to the Wilson children, and also helped the family to forge a community among other African American families in the village who had diverse origins, but who found common ground in food traditions. And now I'm going to pass the presentation on to Nan, who will tell you more about what we've learned about the community of Seneca Village, especially through analysis of the landscape. Well, I'd like to join everybody in thanking the organizers, and I'm really happy to be part of this important and interesting project. Um, as Meredith mentioned, in our research, we found the concept of landscape uh, to be very um, useful in understanding how people in, in Seneca Village took a place and created it in, in ways that were important to them by the locations of their homes and their fields and institutions. Um, settlement in Seneca Village, we think, was in part um, a reaction to the racial animus in the lower portion of the city. So that was a push factor, getting people to leave the lower part of Manhattan. But the pull factor was the appeal of what might have been a healthier and more attractive a refuge uh, in this relatively unpopulated hinterland. Um, so African American residents moved to Seneca Village, especially in the 30s and 40s, and created what was unusual for the time, a middle class community. And then uh, through the 40s and 50s, members of another diaspora, the Irish diaspora, moved into the village itself. So this leaves you with a mixed community. And we might have anticipated that there would have been conflict within the community because in other settings where Irish and African Americans lived together, there was sometimes conflict because they, these were two groups who were both at the bottom of the socioeconomic scale. Um, However, we didn't find any evidence of conflict in Seneca Village, and moreover, we found evidence of positive relationships that lasted even beyond the existence of the village as villagers were evicted and had to move out. Um, African -American, the African American residents of Seneca Village came from many places, as you can see on this slide. They came from eight states, four counties in New York. One resident was from Haiti. They had different backgrounds. They probably had different religions. And uh, they may have spoken as many as five uh, different languages. So how would they have developed communal ties? And we think that everyday practice, um, some of it detectable through archaeology and the analysis of documents, forged bonds among neighbors. Um, and uh, some 
landscape really in all communities represents attitude. People place their homes uh, and their places of work in ways that include some people and exclude other people. And it's a dynamic um, kind of, oh, where's the, it's a dynamic and, and very active form of, of landscape. Um, now what we did was we used census records and tax data um, for uh, the six blocks that are the core of the village from 82nd to 86th Street. And we plotted these data in 10 year intervals so that we could see the growth of the village and we could also see uh, the, the, the way in which the space was used uh, as it was laid out on the city grid. So you can see in the 1830s, there's a small cluster of houses on both sides of 84th Street. Uh, by about 20 years later, that expands to 83rd Street. There's another small cluster that starts in 1840 that's on 86th Street that also expands, but it's a little more complicated in its expansion. 85th Street was hardly used for residences at all, and it may be because that's where the Croton Aqueduct uh, lay, but it also was the spot uh, on which, uh, it was the street on which the city, the, sorry, the village's institutions were uh, laid out. And so the, the community had three churches, three of the five cemeteries were also on 85th Street and the, and the village school was there. So those were all important places and, and that seemed to be the corridor for, the, for those institutions. Um, and here are the churches. Uh, we can't be sure of the ro racial identity of all of the villagers because it's not indicated in all of the records that we looked at. But we know that in the 1830s and 40s, most of them were black. Um, and then uh, we, we know that by 1855, a third of the population was Irish and, and there was also at least one German family that we know of. If you look at the locations of the Irish residents, most of them, there's one that's centrally located, but most of them are located on the periphery of the village, which I think is significant. Um, now, land ownership would have been very important to any community, to all Americans and so on. It's, it uh, offered stability and independence as long, of, of course, as you held on to the land. Uh, land ownership was very important to African Americans. For African American men uh, in New York after 1821, it guaranteed suffrage. Land ownership in Seneca Village among African Americans was five times greater than it was in New York as a whole. So that's a really uh, interesting figure. Um, and land is also essential for those who are farmers. And in 1840, most of the people in the village uh, were involved in agriculture. And this, this too would have generated connections among neighbors who were concerned about their crops and, and other kinds of um, agricultural phenomena. And you can see a number of structures on this uh, 1856 Vieli map that shows barns and stables and things that would have been uh, connected to agriculture. In the archeology, span we also found evidence of um, the domestication of animals such as sheep and goats uh, and we found some wheat in the pollen that we analyzed, and we think wheat could have been used to feed those animals. Uh, if we go back to the uh, to do more archaeology, we really want to try to work in some of the fields and see see if we can identify what some of the crops were. Um, I mentioned uh, positive evidence of uh, associations within the village. We in in the documentary research, and especially the all angel church records, and All Angels was an integrated church, uh, we find uh, records of racially mixed witnesses at ceremonies such as marriages and baptisms, and that's very significant. Um, so we are still interpreting our excavation data and doing additional research, um, and we want to show how people of diverse origins and backgrounds came together to form a village, and we think a community, and we only can wonder how that community would have fared had, had people not been evicted from the land in 1857. Thank you.
I got instructions to click forward twice, but I'm not sure. Is that it? Okay, great. Okay, I don't have any pictures for you. I'm just gonna talk at you. I can't even see you anymore, so it's less scary. Yeah. Uh, do you? Would you prefer light? Okay. Um, how do I? How do I do that? There you go. Okay. Um, thank you, Tomashi, for inviting me to be a part of this panel. Um, thanks to the Whitney for putting it together, especially Andy for coordinating everything. It's really an honor to be here, um, a part of this panel from which I'm already learning so much. Um, I research and write about the early history of the mortgage in America, and I think it's worth mentioning that I really started doing this work because of my practice as a foreclosure defense attorney. Um, I was training to, to do this during the years right after the foreclosure crisis in New England, and at the same time I was reading histories of settlement about that place for my PhD research, and of course I was very interested to see mentions of foreclosure on native lands from the earliest period of colonization. So I started looking for scholarship on the subject so that I could learn more, and then I realized that it didn't exist. Um, that scholars had only told a story that began with when white people started to foreclose on each other. Um, they thought this was very remarkable. Um, but the role of foreclosure on Native people prior to that had disappeared from their accounts. And I want to spend a minute on this point about erasure because I think it's what all the people on this panel are dealing with in their work in one way or another. Um, what makes work like Tomashi's so important, what Kelly and Stephen are combating in the present in their journalism. More than anything, the first article I wrote about the history of mortgage foreclosure was about systemic patterns of erasure. This challenge that we're all really facing right now, the fact that so much about the racial violence that brought this country into being has been systematically filtered out from dominant accounts about our institutions and our economy. We've been missing these specific material histories, and I think you've gotten a sense from um, our archaeologist friends of how much goes into that work of recovery. Um, and these absences really shape what we know and think and believe. And we're faced now with the challenge of having to go back and unearth these histories and to try to find out what happened as well as to try to understand what it means. So I wanted to show what was at stake in recovering a history like this to show that these histories are a part of the story of the development of systems and practices that we have with us still, like foreclosure. Most basically, um, I told a story about how simple routine foreclosure was not something that existed in England, but it began here, way earlier than scholars had recognized, as early as 1615, as a tool of native dispossession rooted in practices of predatory lending. And I'll say more in a minute about all of that, but again, my goal was to give readers a sense of how much we lose if we don't look at the history of how instrumental racial violence has been to the formation of this market. I'm working on that still, and um, what I've already described in that previous paper is how for more than half of a, a century, colonists reserved this radically new form of mortgage foreclosure, again, something that never existed in England, um, the seizure of lands for non-payment of debts, exclusively for use against tribes in order to take native lands. And now the question that I'm asking is, how did a practice that began as a racially targeted practice like this eventually become a tool of general use? How was it that colonists went from using this new creatively violent form of the mortgage only in transactions with native people to extending this practice, this violence to one another? In the 1670s, colonies start adopting legislation to make lands liable for debts um, in transactions with one another. And in the, more, the next decades, more and more colonies also start letting colonists foreclose on each other. And ultimately, in 1732, Parliament passes an act making land liable for unpaid debts across all of the colonies. So this really becomes the general law of the land. And with these changes, um, colonies made this practice of foreclosure, the new kind of liquidity that it gave land, the flow of credit that it facilitated, all of this became a very fundamental part of their commercial activities and also of their land system. Co colonial economies really probably would not have survived, let alone flourished without these practices. And so again, how does a specific targeted practice of racial violence get adapted to become a cornerstone of the speculative global market that creates America? And why does this happen? 
So I think the story gives us an example of how race and financial innovation and market growth um, work in America. And what I'm suggesting is that we think about these transformations to the mortgage as innovations um, that colonists came up with in response to market challenges. So they devised these creative new instruments as ways of dealing with market obstacles that basically challenge the survival of their enterprises. And so to contextualize the first innovation, um, just a little background on colonial history, settlements were very precarious for many decades. The colonists were totally indebted to investors and creditors, and they were also dependent on local tribes to help them find and grow food. Land was really important to them from the start, even before it became the main commodity that colonists were circulating amongst each other. They needed it to establish a military occupation. It turns out that land is still really important to military occupations. And since it wasn't easy to recruit people to come over from England and act as fun functional militia, they also recruited people by promising to give them land in America, which was another policy innovation that brought people over in hordes. Occupying more land also helped them spread disease, chase away game, to kill, displace, and dispossess tribes in those ways, and it gave them obviously more uncontested access to resources like timber and furs and the cash crops that they started to grow to send back um, to make quick profits. So colonists were always looking for ways to get more land. Um, and in addition to these famous fraudulent practices of purchasing land and outright wars, as one method among these other methods, they also innovated and used this new form of the mortgage. They set up shops, um, merchants did, and they gave out goods, bolts of cloth, blankets, other things to native people. They claimed debts. And then they took lands as collateral um, when native people failed to pay in a way that was unheard of again in England. Um, they wrote out mortgages and foreclosed on them, and I know I've said this twice already, but um, I just want to emphasize that if members of tribes were confused by these practices, people in England also would have been very confused by these practices at the time. Um, now, these actions had a lot of consequences. For one, colonists um, maintained a very strong distinction between the mortgage practices they used on um, native people and on each other for a very long time, um, over decades. And this is part of their building an economy um, that works on the basis of different treatment for different groups that are racialized in a way that the English economy was not. Um, and while they were forging this radical new form, so while they were forging this radical new form of the mortgage um, to foreclose on native lands with other settlers, they maintained all of the traditional protections um, that people had enjoyed forever in England, where foreclosure was very rare and full of hurdles because English law protected a family's attachments to its homelands over generations. There, it was really difficult to lose your land for non-payment of a debt. And it wasn't long before creditors recognized the new opportunities inherent in this practice of hitching land to credit. Um, all the colony colonists were living on credit at this time, and creditors were employing very predatory practices on settlers as well and having a hard time getting paid. Um, so creditors began to pressure colonial governments to allow lands to become collateral pretty early. And this was a very serious threat. If they had really stopped giving colonists credit, um, it could have really destroyed these settlements in the early period. But um, for many decades, colonial courts and legislators um, held out, and they called creditors bluff. And even when colonies were in total economic crisis, they openly resisted making these changes. Changes. In some cases, they made the protections um, of colonists' land for non-payment of debts even stronger than they had been in England before. So they're really bending over backwards to maintain these protections um, and this racially divided set of practices until the 1660s, 1670s, when you see the mortgage change again. So this is the second innovation. Now, the first experiments with foreclosing on settlers were actually in the Caribbean, in Barbados specifically, um, which has a whole series of debates about um, what kind of property can be treated as chattel for the purposes of debts, and they consider treating slaves like real estate and real estate like chattel, and the opposite and the same, and they change their policies back and forth several times, beginning in the 1650s. And there's no doubt to me that um, these experiments influence the events that lead to the 1675 Massachusetts legislation that really leads in making the racial mortgage race neutral for the first time on the mainland. Um, but these changes in Massachusetts are also precipitated by another local market challenge, which is that in New England, um, by 1660, the colonists have killed all the beaver. 
This is the main market commodity on which they've come to rely. Um, and in 1660, settlers are on the hook for pelts, but they can't produce them um, to pay for all the goods they've received on credit, and it's a crisis. And what you see is that beginning around then, when settlers cannot produce the beaver pelts that they promised, um, they begin to lose their lands. Um, for non-payment of their debts. Their creditors start foreclosing on them, beginning with the very poorest settlers. Um, many of these old families were connected by marriage, but they start by foreclosing on the least connected members of their communities. Um, they begin taking other settlers' land for unpaid debts, and at the same time, um, the native people who have promised pelts to those traders in turn uh, on credit, um, for credit, and goods are also indebted for pelts that no longer exist. So you see an acceleration of foreclosures on native land as well. Um, in some cases by the same settlers who are in turn learning their lands um, to foreclosure for unpaid debts. And the record really kind of explodes with these foreclosures. Um, Medicom, otherwise known as King Philip, lost a lot of land by foreclosure in the years just before King Philip's war. Um, so there's a lot of implications in this history that we can talk about later, but I just want to name a few. Um, one is that foreclosures on one group, this first innovation of the racial mortgage from several decades back at the point of the second, really provides the model for this practice, um, the new adaptation of this instrument, um, showing us that creative forms of racial violence introduce and normalize financial innovations that eventually spread an essentially similar, even if modified, um, really the same form of that coercion ultimately to everyone to shape the economy. I think we might learn something um, from this history about how to think about financial innovations in the present and how they work too. Um, second, it also practically enables this innovation. One of them enables the other, this race-neutral form of the racial mortgage. Um, you know, in many cases, these, simpler, these settlers would very simply not have had the land to lose through foreclosure if they had not foreclosed on tribal lands in the first place, um, if they were not foreclosing on tribal lands at the same time. So the racial violence not only produces the inequities and the hierarchies that facilitate the redistributive work of the mortgage, but they also produce the commodities and the values that are being transferred through these practices. Um, those values would not exist in the first place without them. Third, this new vulnerability to foreclosure drives settlers' incentives to accumulate more and more land um, to use as collateral for credit. And eventually, colonial legislatures also agree that the best way to attract more credit and investment um, to get more cash flow into their struggling colonies is to allow more foreclosure, leading to this legislation that I mentioned at the expense of many individual colonists who might die bankrupt or are forced to indenture themselves, but it's good for the development of the whole settlement. And this should sound like familiar logic in our cities today. Um, back at the end of the 17th century, this new policy is really galvanizing credit practices in America, which were already important before. But now it gives them stakes and scale and um, profit possibility that they haven't had before. These practices make land more liquid. They drive the speed and the extent to which land is becoming commodified so that land literally becomes a kind of currency in the colonies. And by the end of the 17th century, property in Boston, for example, is getting sold and resold and mortgaged every few years. Um, this should also sound familiar to us in our cities today. Lastly, the influx of cash is driving colonists' capacity to engage in further conquest, to pursue further territorial expansion, and dispossess and displace many, many more peoples in other places. Um, it also increases colonists' capacity to purchase slaves and grow their plantations in that way. So after the passage of the Debt Recovery Act, you see dramatic growth in the scale of the slave trade. So this adaptation, this development and the popularization of this new form of foreclosure is driving the production of both of these forms of commodities which are rooted fundamentally in racial violence. The seizure of land, the seizure of people, their treatment as chattel within a set of growing legal market institutions that have never existed before and without which the colonies certainly could not survive, let alone grow as fast as they end up doing. And that means above anything else that it is helping to drive the destruction of countless lives and life worlds and political societies with incalculable knowledges. And it's these indescribable losses that are rendered invisible by the practices of erasure that I started out by talking about. I'll end there. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, we're actually, uh, we're going to move forward into the present. Uh, we're the team of reporters that are covering uh, basically the dispossession of land of black and brown uh, property owners in current um, state of New York City. We also want to open by thanking uh, Tomashi for highlighting our work as uh, local reporters. It's a big deal. The Whitney and Andrew for putting this entire panel together. Yes, thank you. So um, I, I want to start by saying a little bit of the history of uh, property takeover in New York City it goes back to the 70s and 80s when there was a lot of, of property just to set the stage. There was a lot of absentee landlords. It wasn't the gentrification it is. And it was during this time that the city created the uh, HPD, the uh, Department of Housing Preservation and Development, was created in the 70s or 80s. And it, it was created specifically to take over these distressed properties that a lot of cases were abandoned. Landlords abandoned properties in New York City. There was no money. and. At the same time, a group of nonprofits came up to redevelop. They did something called HDFC, which is a uh, basically uh, if you're uh, uh, if you're a low income uh, resident, you get an opportunity to buy your like uh, a condo. Like or squatters room. that that took over buildings, the city was literally giving them at a dollar to anybody that would take them. Fast forward, and at the same time, there was redlining being done in New York City and in Brooklyn, and people that were black and brown were kind of, if they wanted to buy a brownstone, they were kind of stuck in certain communities like Crown Heights and, and Bedford-Stuyvesant in, in central Brooklyn, and they couldn't buy in places like Park Slope, other areas. So they, they bought these actually beautiful brownstones, and here, here's where we go with Maureen Saunders right here is uh, I received a call from a source, and uh, Kelly and I worked together, and Subas is a photographer. This was a nurse from uh, Trinidad, and I got a call. Steve, you, you gotta come down here. There, there's something wrong. And I called Subas, and I went, and we looked at the woman's paperwork, and what happened was she was behind uh, $3,000 on her water taxes, and there's a woman that bought her beautiful brownstone in the, 80s and it was completely paid off completely paid off and her son was at the kitchen table and he's looking at it and i'm i'm thinking something's wrong and she got a notice that hpd which is was created with gave her property away to one of these nonprofits. and uh, subasa took this photo i don't know if you want to address it or you want to go to the next one from there Kelly and I started, all of a sudden, people were, were calling me and Kelly, and it turned out that there was how many properties on the list? Uh, well, just to go mm -hmm. back, Miss um, Saunders bought her home as a nurse with her husband, who's now deceased, for only about a couple hundred thousand dollars. Her home now is valued at over a million dollars. It was bought for 40. Right, five, correct. Right. And then, oh, it's worth more than a million dollars now. The property was trying to be taken under what is now called the third party transfer program, in which the city deems your property as long well, as you have slide. at least a thousand dollars in um in back taxes or any property taxes they deem your property distressed as they call it and are able to then take it give it to a non-profit and they then develop it for for-profit non-for-profit for their own um basically uh, uh they put it basically into their own management and then it the person who stays living there will then have to start paying rent instead of being an owner um, and then this is basically the uh, notice that she got, that she got into the third party transfer. The, this is her actual brownstone today. She lives in Crown Heights. If anybody's been in Brooklyn, it's a very, the gentrification sweeping through there is very fast. Um, and real estate is a very big deal. It's worth millions of dollars. Um, and so this is the outside of her home. 
this right here is another uh once this, we started second, right yeah. once we started people then started calling us with similar stories about how their properties were being taken by the city they were being targeted and they were getting these notices that they were now owing rent instead of being uh, property owners this is mr mcconnell dorsey he's um from haiti he's an immigrant he bought a couple of brownstones in east new york and he got the runaround when he tried to pay his um tax in 2017 and then ended up getting a notice and then becoming part of this program. He, to this day, is still fighting to get back possession of his deed to his property. He's part of a, a class action federal lawsuit. He's, he's one of the chief litigants. This is, uh, Subasa took the photo. I want to bring Subasa in. <laughs> he, yeah, he's a very yeah. talkative guy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what, what did you like about this photo, Sebastian? <laughs> what did you see about uh, it's, it? It's not a matter of like or uh -huh. um, but th th right, so this is the notice that he received. Um, and by the time he received this notice, talking to okay, the mic. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so he received this notice and, and he immediately contacted HPD and all the, uh, the, the, the um, um, you know, uh, the, the elected official, local ele elected official, and uh, try to resolve the issue, um, but it just didn't go anywhere, right? They, they, he paid all the bills that he owed. So by the time he, they, they, they contacted Steve and Kelly, uh, uh, it was sort of a last resort, contacting the local elected, uh, uh, local media, trying to um, at least get attention from the public. Okay. Yeah, if you could just... Uh, we're gonna, we're oh, gonna move forward right. just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to fast forward just because this was about a year ago when we started this investigation. So it's almost been a year to the date. We started September 17th. We started with Marlene Saunders. Um, so this is fast forward a couple months. I'm not sure how many are you aware of local um, elections. The man in the middle right here is Keith Wilford. He ran um, against um, Attorney General Letitia James for the same seat on the Republican ballot. Um, the issue of black and brown property ownership became part of the campaign, um, as both of them obviously um, made it an issue because property ownership for many of the people, including the people in this picture, Mr. Dorsey, um, these people are known as people that are house rich but cash poor. So they're working class people that literally put all of their wealth into their homes. And when they are taken, that's all they have to give on to their family and to give them a leg up. Um, so it became part of this entire issue for running for state office and local elections. That's uh, Mr. That's Keith Wolfer right there. This is Mr. McConnell Dorsey. These two people right here, this is uh, Lamar Jones and his aunt. They also got involved in the third party transfer program for a larger building um, in bed -Stuy, And they were also there fighting to get their property back. And then these are some residents from, um, let me go back one. These are some residents from the property that was being targeted to go into the third party transfer program. Um, they're long term tenants, they're low income, some of them are on fixed income, they've been living there for decades, had no idea that their property was being taken over by the city until basically they got this little piece of paper about the timeline about how it was going to work. Um, this, the third party that took over the nonprofit basically said, we're going to move you out of your building for a couple of years because we're going to fix it up for you and then potentially move you back. Um, yeah, yeah I, I just want to add on this. The I went to a meeting and they went after they took uh, uh, Mr. Jones's building. They they put this in the lobby and they announced to the tenants, we're going to move you out. We know it's affordable and we're going to find something, you know, good for you to live. And, we, and then we're going to move you back in and it's still going to be affordable. W one thing that's uh, and I want to mention as a side note that nonprofits were given a really good deal. And, and the deal that they're given is when they take over property, they get zero and one percent interest to redevelop a property. And if they get $10 million, they get a 10% fee from the, so if, if they get a $10 million interest-free loan, they get a million of it as a development fee. And then when they move the people in, they, they also can jack up the, the rents. I just, I was looking at a story and they also get section eight housing. So now they tell people that it's affordable 
but all of a sudden the rents are, are doubled. So, and, you know, and this is the, the kind of stories they tell the people, we're going to move you out, but we're going to move you back in. And these are some of the tenants. Um, so this kind of collage right here goes to play too. So once the story kind of broke, we started following all these people and it became that it was clearly a systemic issue that was happening in particular neighborhoods over others. Um, in this picture, we have Judy Ventura at the top. She's from Williamsburg, a working class Latino. She raised her kids in her home um, and it's a co-op. We have down here the congressman who represents that um, area, Hakeem Jeffries from the Democratic Party, Mr. Dorsey once again. And then right at the top corner is uh, a representative from HPD. This was a, a massive, massive town hall. Hundreds of people came. It was packed. It was standing room only. And all these people were pleading for help to get their properties back um, and to get possession back of their deeds. Um, and this is kind of the exchange. You can see a lot of frustration. Um, the woman up at the top, Judy Ventura, um, she was part of a, uh, moving forward a little bit, she was part, after all these stories came out, she was part of um, six people that sued the city for their deed back in Brooklyn Supreme Court. Um, and they actually ended up winning. It's kind of a historical win because nobody's ever won their deed back from the city, um, let alone six deeds. Um, and so this, uh, once they won it back, uh, a federal la class action lawsuit was also filed um, in the Southern District of New York, which they're fighting for right now. The city continues to claim that they're only taking properties as a form of debt collection while communities of color continue to see their properties taken. This is an image from a recent um, city council public hearing in which the councilman all the way up here, Robert Cornegie, um, presented data basically saying that there's actual racism and that the program is actually taking systemically taking property out of certain communities over others um, in Brooklyn it's Bedford Stuyvesant it's Crown Heights um, East New York and then in the Bronx it's the South Bronx um, where basically immigrants are being dispossessed of their properties and not being told about it over minute minute uh, property unpaid debts or water bills um, the woman in the picture down here she's from the Dominican Republic like she lives in the Bronx and she was at this council hearing. We're gonna go again. Uh, here again is at the council hearing. The gentleman right here is the city councilman, uh, Richie Torres. He leads the oversight and investigations committee for uh, New York City Council. And basically they're right now looking at the program, looking at ways of reforming the program. Um, they're set to introduce some legislation this fall that will increase the threshold when it comes to um, the amount of debt that they can trigger you to go into the program, the types of properties. So people like Marlene uh, Saunders that we saw earlier, her beautiful brownstone won't be even included. Um, there's also a thing in the program where it allows a mechanism where if one person on your block owes uh, unpaid debts to the city, the entire block can be looked at. So basically it's like guilty by association. If your neighbor is guilty of paying, of not paying something and you might have been also late on your taxes, but not at the threshold that they're at, they can then look at you and target you. It's called clustering. It's something that they're also trying to get rid of um, and look at it as individual case by case basis and not as a whole community just because um, as we spoke earlier, redlining, a lot of these blocks are full of um, African-American families, Latino families. So it feels like they're being targeted as a community. Um, and then so this kind of this meeting was to present all this data um, and all the facts um, about this actual program that's literally taking property from specific communities. Just to put it into context, uh, 420 properties were targeted for the most recent round of uh, the third party transfer program. Of that, none of them were in Staten Island. Um, the half were in Brooklyn, a third were in the Bronx, and only a small portion were in Queens, just to put it into perspective. And uh, that's more of the hearing. And just as a, a another part of the legislation is that a lot of these uh, nonprofits were doing foreclosure counseling, and oddly enough, they wound up taking the property after they counseled the the property owners and found out they were they were you know owed money and all of a sudden these same nonprofits were 
obtain the rights, the ownership to the property. So part of the legislation uh, that uh, Councilman Cornegy is, is looking to introduce is that nonprofits, that, that council cannot take the property that they're counseling. Yeah. Right, yeah. And then that's a, another picture. Did you want another? No. Okay, that's Thank it. You. Thank you. Um, so my name's Tourmaline, and that was so intense to um, experience, and I was sitting in the back, and I could feel a kind of collective um, grief and loss. Um, I know I'm certainly feeling it, um, and like rage, right? Um, and it reminds me the saying that we used to say a lot when I was a community organizer about how the system isn't broken, it's actually built this way and it's doing exactly what it um, was designed to do, right? Um, and I really appreciate how this conversation is um, situating that in the long legacy of colonialism and anti-blackness that has shaped and um, operates as the ground, the little, literal ground um, of New York City and the US. Um, so, thank you for making this conversation happen. It means so much to me that y you organized today and that um, your work is just um, what is bringing us together. So, thank you. Um, and I'm a filmmaker. Um, the piece that I'm going to share is a small excerpt from Mary of Ill Fame, which um, isn't out yet, and no one's seen this before besides, um, you know, my partner who's in the audience and Nina, who is one of my producing partners, who's also in the audience. Um, so everyone here is kind of the first time, um, and it's not done yet, so um, I just wanted to give that as a um, kind of uh, way to look at the work, right? It's as if, you know, um, an artist uh, who is a painter brought you into the studio and was like, here is, um, you know, the outlines and, and sketch of, of a broader piece of work. Uh, a, um, a film that is done that's part of this suite of work is at the Brooklyn Museum until December. It's called Salacia. Um, and it is about uh, this person, Mary Jones, who is a New Yorker. Um, who was a black trans sex worker living in Soho in the 1830s um, and arrested um, uh, for stealing this person's wallet. And uh, during the process of um, researching her life, I came across her actual interview transcript um, uh, wh while she was in court being, um, you know, interrogated, and um, she was someone who lived on uh, Green Street in Soho with other, um, you know, girls of ill fame, um, and so that was, you know, very much the, the, the world in which she was moving through, and she was outed as trans um, when she was arrested and then sentenced to Sing Sing in um, upstate and at the time, Sing Sing had a mining program that, um, you know, free labor was happening through. So uh, Sing Sing miners were people who were building the kind of literal, physical infrastructure of New York City um, that were kind of moving through around today. And um, Mary Jones was an outlaw, um, an unruly figure, and her story I had been, um, you know, just fascinated by for a very long time. Um, and also the setting of Seneca Village um, is a place that I had been thinking about and writing um, through. Um, and I did a, another film called Atlantic as the Sea of Bones and it draws its title from this poem by Lucille Clifton about how huge violences, violences like the transatlantic slave trade, um, colonialism, anti-blackness, not that those things are separate at all, um, continue to shape a landscape well after they're supposedly over. And so, um, to me, Seneca Village as a place of uh, power, 
a place that um, was demolished to make way for a park, Central Park, that actually could have gone multiple places. Um, you know, the Manhattan, uh, where Seneca Village was, right next to Jupiterville, um, wasn't the only site that was considered um, for Central Park, which was something that was really fascinating for me. And it was, um, in many, by many accounts, put there because of the kind of political power that people, uh, black people, had who were living together, who were um, making community together, who were also, uh, some of whom, who were voting. Um, and so I drew upon uh, speculative fiction, uh, kind of um, storytelling, that uh, from some of the stories that I grew up on, like the people could fly. And um, there are stories where we imagine, kind of, and start with a question of what if, right? Like what if, um, you know, people who were brought through the transatlantic slave trade continued to know magic, right? What if the way to fight back isn't just through um, kind of more respectable, more respectable, respectable, respectable um, ways of, of fighting uh, a system that was designed to kill you, to enslave you, to steal your land, but also through magic. And so the story that um, Mary of Ill Fame tells is one where people continue to know magic um, and use magic to fight back um, and have kind of clashes with people who are more respectable um, and don't quite understand that. Uh, the character um, Peter, who kind of plays um, in one of the scenes against Mary, is uh, built off of, uh, in reference to David Ruggles, who was uh, a newspaper um, journalist and an abolitionist in New York. Um, and then there's a kind of evil villain character, Fernando Wood, who was the mayor of New York at the time uh, when Seneca Village was destroyed. Um, and we're gonna watch two scenes. Uh, and the first is Mary um, in a house that's filled with other people who uh, you know, fled with her from Soho. Um, you know, one of the things in my research that I was learning about was actually, you know, the distance between Lower Manhattan and Seneca Village, it was quite a, quite a bit, right? And it cost a dime to take a trolley. Um, it was a long day's walk. Or you could, like, hitch a ride with a baker who might be going up that way. And so I kind of think about the many ways that we're resourceful and hustle our ways to places that are, har are far for us um, and how it exists as a place of fugitivity. Uh, and unruliness. And so the first scene is Mary hanging out with her friends who came with her from the brothels of Soho, um, where she's like scrying. She's doing intuitive-based magic about this kind of larger plan that's going to shape her life. And then the second scene is her talking to Peter, uh, who is a landowner, about, about what they need to do. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Let's take a picture together. Whew, boy, my heart is uh, pounding. Um, this is uh, surreal. It's very surreal. Whew. So thank you for being here. Um, thank you, Andrew Hawks. Uh, thank you, Megan. Thank you uh, to the amazing, incredible, and valuable staff of the Whitney Museum of American Art for having me, for having the cohort that I get to be a part of in the Spiennial, and for um, being so supportive. Um, words don't normally fail me. Yeah, for being so supportive, and um, as Andrew said earlier, we've had many conversations uh, throughout this show before anyone knew who we were as a cohort and, um, and throughout about, um, about this work um, and uh, what today could be. Um, I'm just so incredibly grateful. Uh, thank you to Kelly, Subasa, and Stephen 
for your tireless work as contemporary journalists, um, the kind of journalists that so many community members uh, were able to reach out to uh, when no one else heard their voices. I wish I could remember how, I, how exactly I came across the first article in your suite that I, that I stumbled upon. Um, it uh, shocked me so much, kind of like the way that I'm feeling right now um, that Tourmaline very well articulated. Um, I'm overwhelmed and I feel like I should just, there's so many things, right? So I'm like really happy to be here and all that stuff. But um, we are standing together in, um, uh, you know, uh, rising water of truth, um, uh, a generational story that implicates us all. And, um, and I'm overwhelmed by it. Um, so yeah, when I found your article, I, it, I just, I don't even, I don't remember how I got there because all I could then think about was what you were telling and what Subasa was picturing in the pictures that he was making of the people who were um, in the middle of being robbed. <sighs> and then immediately um, I thought about the narrative of Seneca Village that I learned about. And um, I have to thank someone who I hope is in the audience, but I'm not sure if she made it, Babby, um, and the good people at the uh, Robert Blackburn printmaking workshop um, that allowed me to, um, to help, that helped, it was a space that helped make this work that's in the show. Um, but while I was there, oops, sorry. Yeah, that's all I asked for. <laughs> Because I didn't really expect to be talking. Because um, uh, I'm so um, obsessed with the people who were on this panel, who were so kind of, kind to come. So um, yeah, Babby introduced me to Marie. And Marie was kind enough to walk with me and the, uh, the Whitney production crew through the site. Um, and we had an amazing conversation. Thank you so much. Um, and then uh, learning with Marie led to learning more about Nan's work and Diana's work and Meredith's work as the archaeologists. Um, and then uh, in the middle of, of all of that, K. Sue Park wrote this amazing text that's in uh, the Journal of the American Bar Foundation, Law and Social Inquiry. I'm sorry I don't have copies for everyone, but um, anyone who's been in my studio in the last year probably has a copy because I was giving them out, like, were there's originals in a church lady's bag. Um, it's called Money, Mortgages, and the Conquest of America. Um, and that blew my mind and continues to blow my mind. Um, uh, so I saw all these linkages and um, it's just kind of like amazing to hear everyone come up and speak about their work. And you all, you don't know each other. I mean, say for Marie, Nan, um, Diana and Meredith, uh, you all, like the, the work was seemingly disparate before we started this conversation, right? And um, uh, and some of you have said a lot of the same things, like, um, what have you said? Uh, some of you have like repeated the same things. At one point, Marie was talking about uh, the journalist, the journalist of the 1800s, being the 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 ones who uh, were able to picture the space of Seneca Village through their articles that she was able to find in her research. So much of this is about research, and for us to be able to culminate. Um, for it to culminate in Tourmaline's uh, imagining the internal lives, the real lives of people who move through these spaces, it just uh, blows me away. Um, we've gone from uh, what has, what, what's in the earth, um, inside of the earth, brought, brought, brought up with the hands of uh, young New Yorkers um, by the archeologists. We've um, been taken into that we've been taken from the past to the ultra past to the ultra present with Kesu's research about um, the colonial notion of mortgage um, and foreclosure. And um, uh, in our lifetimes, we've been taken into a place that we all, uh, that none of, none of us can remove ourselves from uh, in the work of Kelly, Stephen, and Subasa, um, their contemporary journalism as this story continues. And, um, and then uh, Tourmaline, uh, visualizing what has been disappeared um, with uh, uh, human beings of this present, um, imagining themselves inside of the bodies of people who have not been properly and fully documented. Um, I think often about uh, the space of not knowing being um, terrifying, both terrifying and powerful. Um, I've learned that a lot this summer with uh, the cohort that I've been a part of. 
And um, uh, the space of not knowing is powerful because, and one of the reasons why it's powerful is because it requires uh, extending beyond what one already thinks they already understand. Um, so this is a shared history that most of us know very little about and can't understand fully because it hasn't been emphasized. It just hasn't. It's not, it, it would not have been commonly emphasized. So here we are together in, um, in a house dedicated to uh, art and art history um, uh, with, uh, inside of a museum education department that has, um, uh, that is filling in the blanks, you know? It's like creating the space for us to fill in the blanks that um, perhaps one would assume our proper education would have handled already. So I'm very, very grateful. Um, uh, and I look f I'm, uh, for us to have this conversation together, a more full conversation together about uh, how we can continue to be reintroduced to the value of human life in public and private space. So um, the, the book that got me uh, really excited about all, all of this um, uh, was uh, pulled from the stacks at the Cooper Union uh, Library, my home library. I'm a graduate of the Cooper Union School of Art. And um, I went home to Cooper Union to start this research. And uh, Dale and um, Claire looked in the stacks for me. And one of the first things that I found in reading, um, reading the acknowledgments in The Park and the People is on um, this one of these early pages. And it says, the researcher said, at an early stage in our research, the Parks Department official historian Mike Siegel helped us unearth early park scrapbooks and other materials, and his successor, Jonathan Kuhn, assisted us in locating photographs despite the budget cuts that have, that have devastated his office. Jonathan is here with us tonight, and I want to thank him, too, for being integral to the researcher's work <laughs> that brought us here. Um, Property-based definitions of public and private tend to be absolute, rooted in legal rights of ownership and control. But the idea of public space as non-exclusive territory is a relative concept. In the modern American city, few, if any, spaces can be said to be entirely open or entirely restricted. Degrees of exclusivity and access are shaped by economics, politics, and culture. Um, and uh, I'm just going to, I'll end with this from page seven, because we'll, we're going to continue to talk. So I'll, I'll take my liberties while seated. But um, municipal power, I'm sorry, municipal use of the power of eminent domain to take possession of more than 800 acres of land for Central Park represented an unprecedented intervention in the real estate market, a precursor to, to city planning and urban renewal. Chapter three, the chapter about Seneca Village, examines how land acquisition affected landowners and the people who live there, reconstructing the world of those forgotten park dwellers and choosing a site and taking the land for a democratic uh, public park. The gentlemen swept aside the concerns of poor and property owning New Yorkers. Um, so uh, I'm gonna welcome everyone to the stage, everyone who's been up here already. Um, and actually, while you do that, I'm gonna look for something else I underlined, right? Is that okay? While they take their seats? Okay. 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 All right. Okay. Boy, they move fast. All right, I guess I'll join you. Oh, so, um, so uh, questions. Oh, I'm moderating. Do I just stay here? <laughs> Is there, there's a mic? OK. Um, actually, can I stay here? Because I'm interested in um, questions from the audience, um, how people are feeling. Um, I'm just kind of like swimming in this right now. And, um, but our time is actually kind of short. Uh, with all of these amazing people. Thank you guys so much. Thank you all so much. Oh, boy. I have some of my former students in the house. I'm really excited about that. Two students from Mass Art that I can see and one, stu and one student from Cooper Union. Um, so is, does anyone, hey, my Skowhegan family is here. My Yale family is here. My Whitney family's here. Um, so uh, where should we begin? 
I'm moderating. I should, I'm just feeling so emotional. Okay, Kelly, can you talk a little bit more about the clustering? Um, can you talk more about the, uh, the clustered foreclosures and how that had never happened before? Um, something that I find interesting that I found in each one of your um, uh, presentations was uh, talking about things that had heretofore had never happened. Um, uh, innovations that had never happened before, market innovations that had never happened before, um, methods of survival that had never happened before, uh, the, archeo the the dig that had never happened before. So too, um, when speaking with Kelly, Kelly and Stephen and Subasa and reading their work in Kings County politics, uh, the clustering of foreclosures going before one judge at one time, unbeknownst to the property owners, had never happened before. Kelly, can you talk some more about that? Oh, does it? Okay, great. Thank you, Megan. Uh, so basically when the foreclosures through the third party transfer program happened through what's called an in rem foreclosure in which you don't get any money back. So even though it's fully paid off, you get no equity back and you become a renter for a low income. Uh, there's a judge in the Brooklyn Supreme Court known as Mark Partnow. He basically signed off over 60 foreclosures at one fail swoop in 2017, three days before Christmas. Um, across 66 properties, all in Brooklyn, um, which most of the foreclosure experts that we've spoken to has, have never seen that before. That same judge, thank goodness, was able to then having to reverse his own judgments earlier this year back again in Brooklyn Supreme Court. Um, the clustering, the whole process behind clustering in this program is basically if there's one home, one property on a block that's owing in debt, they think then there must be something else. Some other people there must also owe debt. So it creates an opportunity for them to quickly identify um, unpaid debts without having to go property by property by property. So if there's 10, oh, let's say 15 properties on one block, um, they're able to say, okay, the one on the corner is owing. Let's see if every, some other people on that same block also owe. Instead of having to look at every single block and lot, and it creates an opportunity for them to basically cash in on their property much faster and take property much quicker than um, them having to go out and look at the sites, basically. Thank you. Um, there's this, uh, this passage at the end of Chapter 3 in The Park and the People. Another book that people should get. Um, from page 91, it reads, park residents experienced the end of their world in stages. First came the orders in late spring of 1856 that would henceforth, that they would henceforth have to pay rent. Let me look at the journalist while I say that. Right? You recognize this language. Uh, that they would henceforth have to pay rent to the city if they wanted to remain even temporarily in the houses and the lots they had long occupied. The, um, then, almost sim simultaneously, the city's invading troops appeared. The 19 members of the newly organized Central Park Police assigned to protect what was now city property. With the police came a crackdown on practices that had been customary among park dwellers. Uh, the resident arrested in the summer of 1856 for selling the park stones, which he had broken up as street paving, was engaging in a business no one would have questioned six months earlier. Other park dwellers were probably similarly bewildered to find that cutting down trees for firewood was now considered a crime. So too were the patrons of a dance hall in the upper park bewildered by a 3 a.m. raid by the Central Park Police. Um, the ending of worlds. Um, Tourmaline, can you, uh, well, actually, I'll throw this out to all of you. Um, and your, uh, um, how has your research allowed you to visualize uh, the ending um, of worlds and perhaps uh, attempts to resist? We can start with you, T. Okay. Um, I mean, that's a really powerful question. I think it, um, for a lot of us who are feeling through these legacies, it feels like an, a, a non-stop ending of worlds. You know, it's just um, on an ongoing upending. Um, but at the same time, finding 
ways to be unruly and disrespectable to that new regime, like the Central Park Police. I think about how, you know, the unruliness in that land has continued for a long time. Like, um, you know, it's like a popular cruising zone still. It is a place where, like, Sylvia and Marsh, you know, Sylvia Rivera used to say, um, Central Park was the bedroom, uh, Times Square was the living room, and Port Authority was the bathroom, you know? Like, <laughs> so I think about just this long, rich um, unruliness that that is like, we're always on the run. And, um, and then I also think about just the, um, you know, the, the ending of life, you know, from, you know, the, the like, killing off all of the beaver. That was wild to listen to. Um, and also, you know, Central Park, um, what, you know, there were different kind of classed parks is kind of what I also learned, um, is that, like, there were pleasure grounds for poor people and low-income people, right? Um, where things like um, drinking and oration and um, just, like, hanging out, having a fun time, those became uh, illegal to do in Central Park, right? That became a place where it was supposed to be, like, for wealthy people to, like, show off their horses and carriages rather than for people to, like, cruise and have sex and, like, speak in, uh, you know, political activity became illegal in Central Park. So I just think about the ways that um, things are legislated all the time uh, to make no life uh, lived here, as, like, Sadia Hartman would talk about. And then also the ways that we continue to uh, make meaning and be, um, in, you know, in flight and unruly to those things. Thank you. Um, archaeologists, can you um, I want talk a little bit more I about I want to that? say something about... Um, Especially signs of life. What happened to Seneca villages, Seneca villagers, because, you know, we have... They did not move as a community. The community that existed was really destroyed by, by having to, to move. Some of them did move together in small groups, but mostly we can't find where people move to. And, and it's also been our goal for years to try to find a descendant. And when Cynthia did the first exhibit, at the end of the exhibit, there was a list of all the names of Seneca villagers, and it said, if, if any of you have you know, oral history from your families of, of having people who lived in this village let us know. And nobody came forward. I think maybe two uh, Irish descendants came forward. And it has taken us until this last year to find, finally, one young woman who was descended from Andrew Williams, who was one of the very first settlers in the village through Cal and through some other people who she reached out actually to us and we finally got in touch with her. But mm -hmm. think about that. I mean, it's, it's, you know, such a long time that's taken to find and, and the community was just destroyed. Okay, Sue. Thanks, archeologists. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, archaeologists, for all your hard work <laughs> in recovering these histories. I mean, it really, I really try to think about the larger patterns and dynamics that emerge from these histories in a way that makes it possible for us to think about what we're living with now mm -hmm. and what we see happening before our eyes. Um, but it really is in the specific detail of these histories that we can even discern those patterns or see what's salient in the present. Um, I mean, there's really broad things that continue. And as you talk, I'm just sort of thinking about um, my practice as a foreclosure defense attorney. And it was completely true then also when communities had, that had been together for a really long time and depended on one another for all sorts of things, mm -hmm. um, for childcare, for transportation, um, for emergency help. I mean, these are all really important resources to people's lives as people get displaced, they get dispersed, and they lose they lose those values. So there's so much that's lost that's not even captured and the kind of um, 
compensation, which never measures up to the value of the property anyway, and all the technical ways that the city or the state or federal government undertakes to calculate what is lost. Um, but as I was listening to all these presentations, I was thinking very much about um, where you see innovations and where you see um, dynamics replicating themselves. And so all these practices, the rep repetitious practices of eminent domain that get exercised, um, these practices of sort of promising compensation. You know, I think you all heard a lot of similar things coming across these different histories and different stories. Um, at the same time, something like third party transfer isn't everywhere, right? It's, it's just something new that's happening. And so um, the market thrives on innovation at a number of levels, local, state, federal, um, and all these things are always happening at once, but there, is, there are two trends that I think it's worth pointing out that the market really tends to follow. One is in trying to speed up the process of transfer, and the other is in trying to reduce the costs of transfer. And that has been true for over 400 years. And so the market has homogenized and done all of these new things to try to speed up the process of transfer, and I think, um, what was it called again? Clustering, right? Clustering, um, third-party transfer, I mean, something like third-party transfer reduces the costs of um, getting challenged because no one knows what's going on. And it takes a whole lot of energy and resources like you two have done and invested to even figure out what's going on in the first place. And that's something I also saw happening as a lawyer all the time. I think this is incredibly relevant to our present to think about um, how these forms of innovations arise um, in unexpected ways, but also how they recycle practices that have been with us for a very long time and why it's so crucial to look at these histories because we see traces of these kinds of tricks, really, these schemes come up over and over and again. And if we don't remember them, then we can't, we don't know to look out for them. And it's much harder to sort of sleuth and figure out what's happening to people um, that are, you know, practices that are having real, very real effects um, in the present. And so um, that is really something that I'm trying to understand sort of systemically as a whole are these things that repeat. But I think it is all part of the same system as Tomashi has been trying to point us to thinking about. And so I'm really grateful to all of you for supplying pieces of the puzzle. I just think it, it should be noted real quick that while the third party transfer program is a, a government, city government run uh, program, deed theft and foreclosures, particularly foreclosures in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. is uh, there's like 60 every week. Mm -hmm. And w one trend that, that I'm beginning to look at as I see it more is banks sell the actual bad mortgages to other banks. Mm -hmm. And with banks going, uh, some of the people that are having foreclosure problems that I'm speaking with now, they feel they own it free and clear. It's like, my mortgage was originally with Chase. They just wrote me a letter. I don't owe them anything anymore. And it's because they sold it to another bank, and banks are actually in the business of selling mortgages that are underwater. And then uh, they have institutional investors. It kind of goes back to the housing foreclosure market where they could short sell it, and they, they get money, like wholesale money, and they're not really working it out with the homeowner because it, be it becomes like a homeowner's like, I used to pay my mortgage to this bank, now they say I have to pay it to that bank, I tried to get a hold of that bank, I don't even, can't find that bank. And it's, it, the foreclosure crisis is still here, particularly in central Brooklyn. It's definitely still here, and I guess I just want to fit what you just said into what I was trying to say, which is that, um, which is that one thing to make one way to make things really fast and really cheap is to have no one contest things, and it's really easy for no one to contest things when no one has any idea what's going on. And one thing that I saw um, really starting to take cases and in investigating different forms of predatory mortgage lending after the foreclosure crisis and after federal regulations that made the big banks stop engaging in subprime lending, is that. Whereas maybe like 20 actors were doing all the same terrible thing to millions of people before and then got regulated and are now not allowed to do that, that market just broke out into hundreds of thousands of different entities doing hundreds of thousands of different things to the exact same population. So that tracking that now and enforcing that now is like playing a game of whack-a-mole. And that depends on innovation. And some of this, you've, we've seen the research and some practices like redlining, obviously, and talks about securitizing. <laughs> um, 
contract for deeds and all of these things that come from our past is at the same time that we see these really new practices, at least new to me, I don't know, maybe there's a historical example of third party transfer we have yet to, to learn about, but I think that there is always at the same time this kind of inventiveness and looking for new ways to sort of um, make a huge profit out of someone else's value that they've put together over a lifetime. Um, at the same time that you see it following the general pattern of just thriving on innovations of the past, present, future, doesn't matter as long as it speeds up the process, <laughs> reduces the costs, which is, again, I think one of our biggest challenges right now is that there are so many of these innovations happening, and it takes someone to investigate each and every one of them um, the way that you all did, the way that I was trying to do as a foreclosure defense attorney, and we just don't have the people on the ground for it. And that's really what we're living in. That's why the foreclosure crisis is still here. I was just going to piggyback off of what you said. So through the third party transfer program, talking about ways that people don't understand, Mr. McConnell Dorsey, who was um, in the background in yellow, the way he found out he lost his property was over very, a lot of months. Um, so the way the program works is you get violations from the Department of Buildings, but you actually owe the Department of Finance, but the actually the Department of Housing is the one that takes your house. So because all three of them are involved, it takes so much work to figure out who actually works the mechanism that sparked you to even get onto the list. Once you get onto the list, they throw you to another department, then they throw you back, then you owe money over here, then your violations over there. So that is one of the things that they're trying to look at is how to streamline this so that when you owe money, instead of I go to this department, you told me I, I have a violation, why do I have to walk a whole bunch of blocks or to a totally different borough to pay it off to then go to a different department to get it back um, looking to streamline it and just be like you're here pay today this is what the issue is and this is how to look at it can I jump in there Kelly of course because I have something written down of just course, for you of course. Oh, um, okay. uh, I'm gonna ask you to keep on talking a little bit about um, uh, about <laughs> the families that you three encountered who paid the city who paid their outstanding um, obligations, but whose accounts were not credited. So their money was taken and their houses were taken. Can you talk about that? Correct, me and Steve will both talk about it. You can start with Ms. Marlene Saunders. Well, and Ms. Marlene Saunders, is this working? <laughs> um, like I said, her, her uh, son is a professional and we sat at her kitchen table and he showed me all the paperwork. He said, here is the bill. I paid it. It says that it's paid. The Department of Finance. And, you know, I've been a reporter for a while, and I'm looking at him. Something's got to be wrong. Something's got to be wrong. And I, I looked at it, and sure enough, it was paid. I, I called the city councilman. I, I, I'm like, you got to come down here. Something's, something's not right. And in every case, Mr. Dorsey paid, and they had receipts, and there was some problem between the Department of Finance, like Kelly said, and the, the departments weren't um, like talking to each other. And it, it was, they actually took the money and it was never registered as paid in several of these cases. Right. And, um, and, I, and I do, I have to say again, the more I look at it, it's, it's easy and certainly the government is culpable. But the other thing that's a little bit culpable is nonprofits, because as we look at it more and more, a lot of the nonprofits used to work for HPD, that government agency. They know how it works. They, they've been here when there was a lot of distressed properties. They know the law. And, and I feel the more we look at it, there is a real, it's, it's easy to get down on the government, and certainly we need to look at the government. But we also have to look at this process of how nonprofit organizations in the name of affordable housing are able to take control of these properties. I was just going to add, uh, in the case of some people, their money was taken, account never credited, and they continued to pay uh, with good faith that it was just an error. Uh, Ms. Marlene Saunders, who has turned out to be basically the face case of the entire investigation, um, she basically, the city did say that it was credited to the wrong account. 
um, and in the end said that the error was on her fault and not on their fault when she went down. Mind you, Miss, Dor uh, Miss Marlene Saunders still writes a check to this day when she goes to the Department of Finance for her property taxes. Anybody who owns property in New York City, you only pay once a year, it's every June, and it's reassessed every single year. So to say that a woman who's been paying her property taxes with a checkbook for over 30 years gets it wrong, the one year she gets it wrong is the they one year they her take house. property yeah. is quite significant. Um, the other woman who was mentioned, Judy Ventura, she lives in a co-op with um, working class Latinos. Many of them, English is her second language. She actually is a bookkeeper at her own company, so she keeps the books for the building. And also, the same thing happened to her. When she went down there to pay, she still pays in checks. Um, they said that they were gonna, they took her money, that it was their fault that it wasn't credited to the right account, and um, she continued to pay, again, in good faith that they were eventually going to change the, um, the number on the, the balance, but they didn't. Um, also, to put, also just to add to something that was said earlier, all these people who fought, these six property owners who actually got their property back, they paid out of pocket for their lawyers and everything, so they're still in debt to some of these lawyers just for winning back a deed that should have never been taken from them in the very first place. Um, I wanna jump in with another passage from The Park and the People, because um, this is how this is how it kind of worked in my creative process, like the past and the present just, just seemed uh, merged in such a way that was um, uh, disorienting and also disturbing. On page 70 from chapter three, um, most important, many of the black Seneca residents had something denied to most of their compatriots elsewhere in the city. Security of tenure based on land ownership. Throughout the city, few black New Yorkers owned land because of the barriers imposed by limited financial resources. That hasn't changed. A state law that prohibited black inheritance as late as 1809. I'm gonna read that again, just so we all understand what this research is telling us. Throughout the city, few black New Yorkers own land because of the barriers imposed by limited financial resources, a state law that prohibited black inheritance as late as 1809, informal racial bars on land sales, contemporarily I'd like to include rentals, like the experience of not being able to secure uh, uh, a rentable property once a landowner finds out that you're black, um, which is a very common experience and the high price of downtown Manhattan real estate, which also hasn't changed. In 1850, census takers counted only 71 black property owners. 10 years later, the number had grown only slightly to 85. In this context, Seneca Village, where the Whiteheads willingly sold to African Americans and where land was cheap by New York standards, offered an unusual opportunity for blacks who had some savings and wanted to become landowners. At least some black Seneca village owners, landowners actually lived downtown. Joseph Marshall, a hardworking house painter and AME Zion church member owned five lots in Seneca village, as well as his house on Center Street in Lower Manhattan. Among black Seneca village residents, land ownership rates were extraordinarily high with more than half the black households in Seneca village in 1855 owning property. African American residents there had a rate of property ownership five times as great as New Yorkers as a whole. In 1850, black Seneca villagers were 39 times as likely to own property as other black New Yorkers. Um, and I'd, I'd like to add that um, there's this video that the wonderful people at Sand and Wolf made for the biennial that um, includes the walk that Marie took us through the site, and there's a whole lot of footage from that conversation that I wish could have been included, including the, um, the part about voting, um, about how many Seneca Village uh, uh, black property owners uh, were doing so, did so in an effort, in an or organized and strategized effort for suffrage. Uh, many people owned their properties there and didn't live there. The purpose of owning that property was to be able to vote, um, which is something that comes up in Tourmaline's uh, two scenes that we got to see. Marie, can you jump in on that a little bit about voting? Sure. Um, I also wanted to add that I think, you know, if you think about the incentive to buy property, um, I think, you know, the motivation to buy property for an African-American was to, achieve voting rights, but 
I think in the case of someone like Joseph Marshall, who was actually um, the father of Mary Lyons, who's um, depicted in your um, who's in your tourmaline, work. Tourmaline is wearing a button. Yeah, that's Mary Lyons. So that's the daughter of Joseph Marshall. So Joseph Marshall was someone who was affiliated with the AME Zion Church, which was one of the first um, people to, well, people from the church were some of the first to buy property. And it seems that other church members followed suit. So Joseph Marshall bought property, but he already owned property. So he's someone who already had suffrage rights. So what was his incentive to buy property? It was to invest in property, like lots of other people were doing at the time. So you know, if you think about New York City as a place that was so driven by real estate, I mean, the whole grid plan was, does, you know, the grid, the street grid was designed as a way to sell real estate. I think it's important to recognize that African Americans who were buying property in Seneca Village were doing the same thing that their white counterparts were doing. They were investing in real estate. Um, and those that did not already own real estate were also doing it as a way to attain voting rights. Um, so I think, um, you know, Albert Lyons and Mary Lyons, who in they inherited the property from um, her father, Joseph Marshall, um, they also owned additional property downtown. So this was just an investment um, that they were then paid out for, for when um, the city enacted an em eminent domain. I think one thing that's interesting is that, um, at least as far as, you know, the research that I did for the film, um, property values greatly increased uptown after Seneca Village was destroyed and the park was laid out. So I think that that's like definitely part of, um, you know, the conversation, right, is mm -hmm. like really enriching the white landowners around, um, around the park and then having um, a like pristine, um, you know, a pristine park to to do that, and that is actually not separate from what happens all the time right now. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the like same language, the exactly. Wasteland to paradise. Yes. The 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 neighborhood is safe now. Neighborhood it's a, safe it's now. It's welcoming now. In San Francisco, before leaving San Francisco, I saw something published in the Chronicle about urban pioneering, coming right. urban pioneering of exactly. Oakland that had been pre previously considered a no man's land. Right. And the Atlantic to Sea of the Bones um, was a short film that I shot you know, part of it on top of the Whitney because, um, you know, the Whitney is also implicated in this legacy, right? We're on a place on, um, you know, on the west side um, and the piers that was formerly a place of, like, black, queer, and trans life, right? That was thoroughly, um, you know, policed and gentrified and people were pushed out and now it's, like, a fancy place to go to like the Apple store and like um, see some art, you know? And it's like, so we're all um, like moving through these really intense legacies that are, are ongoing. But I think that Seneca Village and Central Park, um, we see them in some very poignant, extremely violent ways mm -hmm. um, that have very much to do with, with ownership. We have about 10 minutes left on the clock, unfortunately. So I want to open up uh, uh, less than that. I'm getting, getting, I'm getting looks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting served face, um, face service. Um, so I'd like to open it up uh, for maybe, maybe we have uh, room for, oh, really just one? Please, Andy, two, <laughs> two questions? All right, um, who's, who's, who's itching and burning? Our fir first one up here, Andy? This young man? Just to go back to uh, reflect on, <clears throat> on Seneca Village and the displacement of the community through eminent domain. Uh, they were scattered, and of course we, not of course, but we were fortunate enough to find some of the families. But this existed not sorry, only- let me jump in. Can you tell us who you are? Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. It's uh, my fault for not asking that. Shall question. I stand? Um, just tell us who you are. Oh, Cal Jones. I'm the Manhattan Borough Historian Emeritus. And uh, the reason why I, I seize this opportunity 
is because what happened to Seneca Village uh, in 1855 <clears throat> happened to Park West Village mm. in 1956. Mm. Park West Village, and it's all on the west side. Mm. Park West Village is, is running from 97 to 100. That was considered a slum clearance area. It was primarily African Americans living in that area, predominantly African Americans, from from approximately 96th Street, 97, up to 100. And you had a lot of your famous musicians coming out of that area. Okay. And what happened was, the women at Domain, they came in and they declared it a slum when it was really a working class poor area. Mm -hmm. Because all of the people, and I used to hang out in that area, most of the, at that time, and most of the residents there took music lessons, mm -hmm. played instruments, okay? But they, what they did was similar to what happened in Seneca Village. They scattered the people. And what happened in trying to find what happened to the residents, it gave birth to the Department of Relocation because it was, we were finding that the, the residents that were thrown out of the community went to places to live worse than the places they were thrown out of. So that gave birth to what you call the Department of Relocation and then they started monitoring and then they started such things as uh, in order to move the residents more quickly, uh, relocation allowances and relocation bonuses just to clear the site as opposed to just dumping them. But that was just one thing. Uh, I also wanted to mention, you were talk. I'm not that familiar with the TPT, mm -hmm. but I did some years ago have the responsibility of doing a survey of some of the blighted areas in Harlem, running from about 110th Street up to around 125th, from 7th to 8th. Remember that period in the 7th going up to the 8th? And I was asked to do the survey. I worked for the controller's office, and I worked for this. I did the audit of all slum clearance and all rehab work. And I got most of the jobs because most of my white counterparts didn't want to come or go to neighborhoods where it was slums because they said they'd get mugged. But I did the survey because, and this is dealing with TPT. Uh, TPT reminds me of this. I did the survey because there were all of these units of housing and buildings that were blighted and just lying empty and people were being mugged and it was drug havens and you perhaps remember the 70s, that period. So it was the city's intention, HPD housing, intention to do a survey and put these houses back on the payroll or put them in REM, okay? And this is what you guys remind me of. And after I did the survey, and it was hundreds and hundreds of units of housing, that whole area for me. After the survey was done and I turned it in, and so I, you know, being, having been born in Harlem, I was concerned, I asked my boss, well, when are we going to move forward and see that those buildings get put back on the tax roll or take them and use them? Sweat act, that's where some sweat equity came out of. But what they did was they closeted my survey. Mm -hmm. They shelved it. And I said, well, what happened? Well, higher up said, forget it. Now, it was known that most of the landlords had walked away from the property it was not being serviced, and they were not paying taxes. So here, when, when you were telling me about TPT, and I'm listening, okay, here was an opportunity where they could have taken housing, given it to the poor, but because it was people of influence, they did not put it in REM, and they let it lie until now gentr they're gentrifying. And some of the same landlords that had the property years before never lost it. 
what uh, you take. Uh, just uh, to speak to what you just said. Yeah. Um, Thank you so much. So there is this idea that the only reason some of these people are living in these properties is because the city nonprofits decided we can't go and kind of manage these. Let's put some low income people, people of color, um, let them stay there because we know that at, at, certain, po at certain point they'll actually fail. And mm -hmm. when they do fail, that's when we'll swoop in and the money, the properties will be worth what much more, which is kind of this idea that's going, that is happening right now with the TPT program. A lot of these people got the properties in the, in the 80s and at a time where there was a lot of drug um, activity and crime. And they think that basically the city left them to do all the work that the city didn't want to do or these nonprofits to build up these neighborhoods. And now they're coming back for something that they always knew they were going to get back. So yes, exactly what you just H said. was HDFCs. Yeah, HDFCs, yeah. You won't believe sure. this, but we're out of time. <laughs> um, I don't want to believe it. Um, uh, thank you so thank much. You. Oh, thank, thank you. you <laughs> thank you, everyone. Um, Andy? Yeah, you want to close them out? Oh, that's nice. Thank you so much, Tamashi. Thank you for all of our panelists. Um, I just want to let you know that the museum is now closed. Um, so if you have anything at Coat Check, I advise you to go get it very quickly. Um, but uh, yes, thank you so much.